stolen them from over here. <laughs> That's right. Paul has all the strings. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Well, we got a few minutes, so. Did you introduce? I'm Michael Valdez. Hi, Michael. I'm Jane Larrabee. Yeah, you're fine. Pleasure. This has a nice environment. It is a great environment. And we have Tucson, and we have another Floridian. Another Floridian. So we're all warm weather people. What yes. do we know for this cold weather from last night? Oh, you know, I, <laughs> I got off the plane. I, I landed 9 o'clock yesterday morning. I was up with before the worms to get here. But when I got off the plane, my first comment was, it's winter because yeah. it's raining and it's cold. <laughs> what's, going, what's going on? <laughs> well, I was straddling the heater outside last night to keep warm. Yeah, Were I you? was. I was. Yeah. I was sort of like avoiding the heater to stay cool. <laughs> Anything I can do to stay cool, and it's there's something where I just came. Oh, because because it, it, it's so hot. Yeah, well, we've been that way too. I mean, I don't know, like Tampa, but we have gone through some of the warmest weather we've had. In the it's, it's 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 warm. It's just it's just you know it's July and August. It's humid, and uh, it is it is what it is. So. You get you get you get used to it. Um, always kind of feeling a bit damp. You know, I dress like this, and I dress every day. And, um, I only wear ties now when I'm meeting with attorneys or with someone downtown. Yes. Because um, I'm showing up in their office, and they have ties on, so I wear a tie for them. But uh, I spent 29 years in that world of wealth management, and I, every day I went in a suit and a tie. Now that I'm doing what I'm doing now. It is just so free to be able to express. Well, well this is a, a, an important theme, and I'm. Uh, do you know the Encore people? Encore Careers. It's a national kind of nonprofit group that is moving. There's a group in Tampa. I just got off the phone with Bev Rogel, who runs Encore Tampa Bay. They're having a whole um, town hall meeting huh? about this. Yes. So what, but what, you, but what, but what you describe is this career and the secondary encore doing something that's different and some some of the choices. We had the most interesting conversation. Good. Thank you so much. It was great, wasn't it? It's like nobody ever asked me those things. It was delightful for me too. I Thank you, Michael. Michael. Vicky, I, and club cards. So <laughs> if you would like to take one on the way out. Well, I got the, I got the membership is $5. Did you get the actual card, Michael? No, and I, no. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I was sitting here at breakfast this morning listening to this conversation, and I'm going, you know, where else do you get to go to meet these kind of individuals that you get to hear these conversations? And uh, I, I'm in Tampa, not in Altamont. That's my FINRA office. Okay. Where you know, is your email though on that, there? That's my email. Sure, that, I'll send you some things. I always yeah. I'm resourceful. Yeah. And I have a and because that's a because that's a FINRA email. Okay. I'll send you my personal email. Oh, and then okay, because sorry. you and I are not trading or buying securities, yes. we don't need it wrapped up for thirty you years. Want to just write it on here? No. I'll, I'll, I'll that would make it I'll, easier. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'm not supposed to because oh, this is an official call. No, it doesn't matter. No one's going to arrest me. I trust me. I won't tell on you. Big Brother is watching you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, Vicki. How are you? I'm so good. I wish you were here, but I understand. <laughs> right. I'm sitting in very, very warm Boca Raton. Yeah. You have shorts on. No, I don't. I'm wearing a tie and a jacket. Not a jacket. But, uh, pajamas on. So he's got his tie on, but it, yeah. he may have shorts on underneath there. Well... Right? I'll the never tell. On, right? <laughs> You're right. right. <laughs> now, the great thing about doing things through phone is you can wear your pajamas to work. It's That's great. true. I do that often. <laughs> is this your book you wrote? Yeah. It is. It, it's doing amazing things out there. It, was, that, that book, was, was that book sitting out there? Yeah. Can I just see that book? Yeah. Do you want, I, do you want to look at it? I have one with me. I can okay. walk out there and do you that. You want to now work. making a connection. Yes. I'm, it teaches families how to be good decision makers for people who lack capacity. Health, life, and end of life. So you want to own that spiral. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's, but I got the connection with Vicki this morning to understand, now that I understand a little bit about her, 
knowing the author, when I read the book, it'll, it'll connect. It'll, it'll help me connect. Yeah, it's, I'm very proud of it. it. It helps a lot of people. So, Vicki, are you having conference? Oh, my gosh. Are you? I mean, it's just amazing. I, I've met so many Jay great people. Ways. Jay looks so good. What a, what a way to, to have visualized the nightmares we all get into. That you can't, it's like, why is not nothing changing? We're here to help and you don't want our help. I mean, black hole. Yeah. I mean, the, the clarity of it is just amazing. Yeah, he's great. And he thinks differently than all of us. I love that about him. He sees the world well, through J.I. The simplicity in which he expresses it. Yeah. Clarity. Yeah. It works. It's complicated and then it distills down. And I love visual. Uh, you know, the worst thing for a speaker, I'm sure, as you all know, being on platform is to begin a conversation by I want to thank you both for coming today. So <laughs> I'm glad I don't forget if you were here so far. <laughs> David is on a 10 second delay. Oh, sure. Right. Paul, you can get started, I guess. I don't know what the oh, time okay. frame is okay. there. You know, I mean, I know what time it is, but... Yeah, there tends to be a delay. This is a chatty group that we yeah. have a hard time getting to our next event. Yeah. I'd give them another minute. When they told me there was only 25 chairs in here, I said, well, I'm going early because I don't want to be standing outside. Yeah, yeah. Now, does anyone here know Jim Williams? No. How about Jim Zimberg? I met Kathleen uh, Real. Uh, Dean Fowler, I've met. How about Matt Wesley? Oh, he's great. I'll introduce you. Okay, so if yeah. you see Matt, I'll he's on my you. dance card, and okay. I'm trying to find him. Yeah. Okay. Paul, I found him. There you go. So I can put a little check mark. So I'm looking for Matt. Yes. And Vicky. The emphasis is on this. And yes. I'm looking for Susan Bradley. I saw her, but I didn't oh, get Oh, yeah, she was behind me. She was one. Of, I was one of the team table captains or whatever here for this thing. And she was one, and she was two over from me. And Deborah Goldstein? I think. Goldstone? Goldstein. Goldstein. I don't know her. I met her just because she registered and I was volunteering, but okay. I don't remember her. I'm sorry. She also lives in our community, so I didn't want to touch base with her. Yeah. I, just, I, I always feel so good at this thing. I don't you feel like you're with your people, fine. you know, and everyone's on the same path. Well, this idea of tribe that uh -huh. you're talking about um, is, is important. This kind of reminds me of the early days of the old IASP, the International um, Association for Financial Planning. Okay. Back in the 80s, there was a camaraderie of this trying to launch something that, of course, has morphed many times and in some ways has become ineffective. But um, it, it kind of has a, it kind of has a feeling. And um, I've spent 30 years trying to figure out uh, multilingual, multidisciplinary. Um, but it's, it's really not, not easy because there's not a lot of... Uh, Interest and well, so becoming cross cultural. Most people like the culture that they have, but they don't want to go learn. <laughs> and, and we all chose our profession yeah. because we like that niche. The world is changing. Yes. Yeah. We have to speak other languages. And we have a state and trust attorneys over here. Woohoo! Are sort of pioneering of what they're doing. Sorry. Right. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think we should get started. What? So that uh, to be respectful of everyone's time along the way. I remember to grab these. Hey, are you hearing everything okay? I'm hearing everything fine. Oh, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> My brain okay. is already really full, Jane. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, don't delete anything. No. Like Kelly Bundy, where you put new information in and it falls out the other end. Oh, I do have a book with me. I would think that was an accident. That's fine, too. There we go. Plus. Oh, there we go. Oh, so he's just going back and forth.
Well, I'm going to begin, if I may, and I'm going to introduce myself by saying that my name is Paul Vadiato, and I am a family caregiver. Welcome, come on in. Yes, welcome. Come on in. Yes, thank you. Welcome. I take care of my spouse who is no longer able to do things for herself that she was once able to do. Uh, her condition is progressive uh, and it's fast changing. And it has caused lots of changes in my life and it has not allowed me to do all of the things that I have chosen to do in the past. And at some times, we get caught between career, things that we want, and this whole thing of family caregiving. That is what we're going to explore today, is the missing piece of the planning puzzle, non-clinical family caregiving. And you heard last night from John talking about one of the objectives of this meeting was to create a new branch or a new part of PPI in which a new career path will evolve. And I think this is what fits that bill. And then we just heard Jay speak about the little blue people looking into that abyss. And what we do is what we represent those little blue people who are really caught betwixt and between. I, I do want to thank you all for taking time. If I may ask a question of you, how many of you right now are caregivers to someone else? How many of you see yourselves becoming a caregiver? I, I, think, I think that with the changes that are occurring, the aging of the population, at some time or another, we all will become caregivers for the first second or perhaps third time, up and down the generational ladder, and part of what we're going to speak about today is what does that mean in terms of our professions and in terms of us individually. On the screen you see no one right now, but David Lee is there, my, my partner. Uh, David unfortunately was not able to be here in person today for health reasons. and. He is really one of those who really pioneered this 27 years ago. He has created mountains of intellectual property that really is certain the basis of what we are doing. David, you hearing us okay? I hear you fine. Thank you. Okay. So, David, if you would please, can you tell us a little bit as to why we are here and a little bit of uh, what we're here to accomplish? Well, uh, I think that we're here today, and I hope uh, the other people in the room are here, because the subject of non-clinical family caregiving, which I'll define in a moment, really has an extremely important part to play in almost every aspect of our lives, whether or not for the moment we're an active caregiver or whether or not there's active caregiving going around or going on around us. Um, we'll touch upon a couple of things, but caregiving in the workplace is something that has been completely overlooked, and the productivity losses in America are in the hundreds, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, because if you come into work and you're distracted worrying about mom and whether Meals on Wheels showed up or the aide was there, you're not giving the boss the full attention that it deserves. and Caregiving doesn't care who you are. You can be in the C-suite, you can be on the floor as a manufacturer. A number of years ago, the Times had an article from one of the Ford plants in Michigan, and uh, they were talking about caregiving, and the manager who was speaking with the reporters said, see that guy over there? If he's having a bad day with his grandmother, we're building a lousy car. And so, you know, it's just, it's everywhere. And so, before um, we had the opportunity to, to hook up with um, PPI, Paul's been a member for a year or two, we said, what is it that we feel is missing? Because all of you are excellent planners and know how to do what you do very well as subject matter specialists. 
but more and more not only in an aging world but in a world that sees illness becoming rampant in certain categories certainly we never expected to see as many special needs kids all of a sudden with autism and uh, and other forms of illness that create caregivers whether we like it or not and we said there's a part to play in the planning process because the people in the room are the go-to people for those that are your clients and more and more you can either see or it's been brought to you what do I do I've got this incredible problem with grandma with my mother uh, my spouse all of a sudden is showing signs of multiple sclerosis and what does that mean and what does that mean for me and what does that mean for my children so I think we're here today to enlighten or shine a light on where non-clinical family caregiving has a part to play in the planning process and when David, if you would can you differentiate when you say non-clinical versus clinical so that we're very clear as to what we're talking about sure um, long time ago I realized that caregiving was not a disease it's a role and while sometimes it can be so stressful that you need clinical assistance um, in dealing with your stress there is nothing that the medical profession clinical profession ever learned about caregiving a matter of fact most rarely have had any exposure to it and don't even really ask many times whether or not their patients are involved in caregiving and so in order not to fight with the clinical profession I moved it over to non-clinical which is the 85 percent of caregiving that is really practical problem solving and the distinction is that the skill sets that we learned growing up and uh, how to do things none of you would have a problem buying a car but if I said to you go and purchase and you know euphemistically an assisted living facility for a dementia patient or a loved one that has dementia would you know how to do that and most people do not but yet we put an awful lot of folks into dementia facilities and rather than understand and I'm just making this as as an example rather than understanding what it is that our loved one truly needs we walk in the door and say wow could we stay here you know and it's very hard to make the distinction because you're looking at it as uh, what if I had to move into that room and how come it's this and how come it's that and many people walk in and out because they don't know how to do it and that's up and down the food chain and the biggest problem is and I think Vicki you understand it very well because we've discussed it but when you have an emotional involvement in what you're doing it makes it very hard to have a perspective to get an overview to be your own AWAC as it were um, and once you're enmeshed in it and you're you're having the difficulties and things compound themselves you get to a point where you become frustrated burned out and as Paul and I like to say you know your hair is on fire before you begin to seek help so we stayed on the non-clinical side because we did not see anything for the caregiver coming out of the clinical world that um, that really made a lot of sense if I may David from a different perspective we saw years ago that when we were doing planning and I was 29 years in that world of wealth management and we neglected to really fulfill the estate planning for our clients there was a lot of litigation that involved and I submit to you today that as we go forward with an aging population and these issues and complexities associated with taking care of a loved one in a non-clinical way, we will be held accountable for what we did or what we didn't do. And it's not only for the benefit of the families, it's for our own protections that this is something that we need to be included within the planning that we're doing. And unfortunately, it's a difficult conversation 
that is wrought with denial. It is wrought with, well, I'm too young, or this is not going to apply to me, or how do I have this conversation with mom or dad, or vice versa the other way. So it's, it's a discussion that sort of gets glossed over, and the planning is not done, or it's just subjugated to, well, I have plenty of money. I don't need to worry about this because I can buy whatever I need in terms of help. But to continue on with David's perspective, caregiving, it really doesn't care how much money you have or what you don't have. It doesn't care about the illness that you have or the geography that you have. It doesn't care about the function or dysfunction of your family or the illness or any other thing that may be there. When you have these issues, it is there, and they, each instance is going to be distinct, as distinct as your family and as individualistic as a fingerprint as opposed to a finger. And that is a very important distinction on that. David, what are the characteristics that we typically see when somebody's hair is on fire and they don't, mean you, they don't know what to do? Well, when people don't know what to do, one of the first things is when they come to us, it's been through a referral. We don't walk around with a flag and say, caregiver's over here. Um, but typically, whether it comes from the medical profession, the legal profession, the financial world, um, they come to us because we take, as I said, this non-clinical approach. And the first thing they need to understand is that and I think all of you recognize it because in your own fields you are. When you have met a competent authority that you can trust, who lets you do your data dump for 10 minutes and then says, I understand and let's see exactly what's going on. You see that relief coming from their face that somebody does understand and somebody may be able to help me. But just as Paul said, all those individual factors and money doesn't buy much in the way other than the fact that money can buy care in this day and age you have to really understand what care means but um, in, in looking at it the problem with caregiving is that it's complicated it's confusing um, it's complex but m most importantly it's counterintuitive just when you think you kind of understand a little bit about what's going on, you realize, no, you don't. And just when you think you've got things kind of set up in the right way, they flip upside down. And so what we've learned is that in putting together a non-clinical plan for people, when they're dealing, th where we can take their individual components and consider them, that at least, while it may not solve the problem of grandma's Alzheimer's, it at least prepares them for what is coming. And if you can understand your options, even if they're lousy ones, you, you can at least hopefully make wiser decisions and have the comfort and the peace of mind that you did the best you could with what you had at the time you had to do it. And that's a continuing role and a continuing problem and involves everything imaginable and if you look at um, Vicki's book you know she highlights a whole bunch of issues but non-clinical family caregiving takes on those things because as I said caregiving is not a disease so we can't take a caregiver pill. Thanks David. Uh, David and I do a weekly radio show called the Caregiver Reality Hour that is live streamed we're just amazed, literally around the world, and uh, we are we have quite a reach at this point. And we were very blessed to have Vicky on the program, not once but twice, to share some of the insights. And I'm going to really want to get started into some of the facilitation that we're all about today. And I'm going to ask Vicky if you would talk a little bit about what we spoke about on the program, specifically the types of judgments that we that we make and 
getting a little deeper into how sometimes we can evaluate that decision-making process because it was so informative and so much fun. Thank you. Um, one of my specialties is helping people uh, figure out when to step in, how much to step in, because it's like, I think dad's not okay, but he's my dad. It's hard to take over or it's my spouse. And so in bioethics, we have all sorts of lovely tools that simplify it for us. And one is the concept of mental age, that when a person has some, some degree of incapacity, we can measure that by comparing it to what a child could do. And it, we're never calling an adult a child because that's disrespectful. This is a full-grown person, but they have the needs and the abilities of a younger person. And so I find that when I talk this through with families, they're actually relieved that I need to step in. And now I know that I should. I feel more confident. Now I'm ready to take action because it gets them over that hurdle. It also helps with their denial. So we break it into three ranges, uh, 0 to 7, uh, 8 to 13, and then 14 to 17. So if somebody has just a little dementia, you know, they're still doing well. We shouldn't step in and take over. You know, we keep an eye on them because they're mentally like a 15-year-old. They're not quite as responsible as we'd like, but, but they're not... They're not too bad. But when we start getting in the younger ages, we really need to start protecting them because you don't let a five-year-old cross the street. A 10-year-old, maybe, you know, as long as it's a safe street. When I, where I grew up, I wasn't allowed to cross the street. It was a dangerous street. Um, you know, so the rules change based on the mental age and if it's fluctuating, because sometimes the person's better in the morning and worse at night, you can include and empower the person that's disabled to the level that they can be included. So it, it's full of respect that way. Uh, zero to, um, actually zero to seven, six, thank you. I know how I was saying it. Zero to six and then seven to 13. And this actually comes from the pediatric model where at age seven, we start to consider that children have the ability to have like abstract thinking. They can connect their dots. And that children from seven to 13, even though they don't get full consent, they get something called assent and they're allowed to participate in the situation, not decide. And it, it really helps because now, uh, 14 to 17, okay. yeah. So my dad fluctuated from like five to seven up to like 12, and it really helped me because there were times when I could step back and not take over, and there was times when I absolutely had to step in and protect him because a five-year-old cannot protect themselves. Um, once I explained this to um, a, a caregiver, he said to me, I get it. This, this actually works when you're dealing with uh, troubled kids as well. Yeah. Um, to the extent that, you know, your parents think, they, they think chronologically a 23-year-old. Yeah. But when you tell them that they're operating in about group of 14 mm -hmm. uh, it does have that. Yeah, I, I have a relative that started doing drugs at 12, and they tell me that even though he's 24 now, he, he emotionally got stunted at 12. He's growing now, but there's a delay, and so we don't expect as much. So, like one gentleman said to me, my grandfather is mentally eight, and most caregivers actually know. They know, we don't have to tell them how old the person is, they know. And he says, eight-year-olds don't drive, I have to take away the keys. And he was so relieved because his gut had been saying it, but he didn't have the clarity to know why he needed to take action. It's still hard to take the action, but it, it gave him some clarity. Um, another person, uh, was a geriatric care manager, was working with a family, three siblings, all seniors, two sisters, one brother, and they all lived together. The brother had a developmental disability, and the, the sisters had been mad at this brother for their whole life. He just didn't behave the way they want. He, he should. And once they classified him as 11, he, because they said, he's 11. Of course he's not going to be responsible. He's 11. Of course he can't do this. And it really, it really helps because we can, it's not an all or nothing approach. And a lot of people say as the person changes with a lot of diseases, they get worse. It really helps adjust the plan based on the, the new needs of the person. So, you know, Vicki? If I can make a comment, sure, there's a there's a real world situation that we can watch right now that's going on, and that's with the 
Donald Sterling Family Trust. All right. Twelve weeks ago, he was, quote, competent enough to sign over the trust authority to his wife. And then they started questioning his competency. And then it was okay for him to go and hire attorneys to strategically interfere with selling the club, notwithstanding what the NBA wanted to do, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at Donald's behavior that we have seen in public, he looks very much like a 12-year-old that hasn't gotten his way or is being punished for something. And I think that they're going to run into a problem with categorizing it as dementia. It doesn't look like he's forgotten. This looks like something that we call temporal frontal lobe, where his behavior is so aberrant um, that he's acting something well below his age, and would we let a 12-year-old interfere with a two billion dollar sale and um, you know since you've taught me that Vicki I tend to look at things more from that perspective and Don Sterling just seemed to fit right into that picture yeah I mean the reason is the person that taped all of this Viano, he had actually asked her and said can you, I'm forgetful I can't remember things tape everything I'm saying keep a record because that way you can remind me so originally the tape started because he was aware of his own cognitive loss. But you, the, the more co cognitive loss you have, the less self-aware you can be. You know, and so again, 12-year-olds should not be making big trust decisions. So it, it's been interesting to watch this in the courts. And if we bring this back into the planning, at a family meeting where all of us have sat and spoken to the families and we said, well, if this were to, account, to happen, what is it that we would want for ourselves and have an opportunity to express what that would be from mild all the way through end of life type of decisions so that everyone at the table has the ability to understand and comprehend what our wishes are so that there is a consistency and we know where the obstacles are going to be come from. And, Jane, I know you're an attorney. All too often, we see guardianships pop up simply because these families cannot agree as to what that right thing is because the discussion was never had. David used an expression before that we use a lot on the radio show, hair on fire. Unfortunately, that is where we get involved all too, many of, too much of the time where it really should be an issue that is discussed right alongside the planning, like estate planning, like legacy planning, like philanthropic planning. It's that, okay, let's talk about what this is going to be from the perspective of what, what it is that I would want. And I want to bring this into another category for your discussion as well. We've all read the books and we've all participated with high net worth families and creating structure to how that multi-generational family will, will run. We talk about family councils. We talk about family compacts and constitutions. We even go down as far as defining what family is. And we know the rules of the road, if you would, as to how this is to play out. And Let's use a scenario where we describe family in those documents to me, the children, their spouses, the grandchildren along the way, and the family has come among their values that they will take care of whatever costs that would be associated with health. Does that sound unreasonable to anyone? As may that one more time. Family said it's our value is to maintain the health and wellness of our family, but if someone who is defined within the family becomes ill, the family will step up and will help defray the cost or assume the costs that are associated with that care. You said is that reasonable? Sorry? Is that the question? Is that reasonable? Is that, is that something that we would normally see in typical type of planning, as we would discuss family constitutions, family combats. I don't know that it's always so obvious that they said that. I think it's kind of below the surface. That's what's going to happen. Yeah, well, 
there in and of itself is something that maybe needs to rise a little bit higher because it's going to become much more prevalent. Uh, and I say that, but is the funding there? Uh, let's assume that money, the zeros are there, and that's not going to become an issue. But in order to maintain family harmony, we want to set the boundaries of what that's going to be. And children, their spouses, the grandchildren, whatever that may be, be it autism, be it Alzheimer's, be it uh, cancer stroke, we're going to make sure that they have the best of medical care, the best of care in the home, and their wishes are going to be carried out, and money won't become the obstacle to that. And I know I've seen that a lot of the planning that I've done throughout my years in wealth management. But I came across a situation that sort of threw it out of whack. And I want to present this to you because this is where, this is where the conflicts arise. And this is where we start to see some of the dysfunction occur. We had a situation in those definitions, like the one I gave you, where the, uh, the daughter-in-law's mother uh, became an Alzheimer's patient. And it was a rapidly progressing Alzheimer's where the daughter-in-law now had to spend more and more time with mom. And the son, while had resources, certainly did not have the resources that were going to be inherited or that were going to be controlled by the family documents uh, that were existent now and were going to come into greater fruition later on. So the family that did not necessarily have the obligation to pay for that care, but it was very impactful to the son. It became very resentful that his wife was no longer there. The son was now distracted from the obligations to the family business because was helping the wife take care of the mother, the children, grandchildren, were now resentful because mom was devoting more time and attention to her mother than to them, their own family. So now we come as advisors to this family. We say, well, we created this legal document defining family, and now we have something that's outside of the box what are we supposed to do? They come to you with this problem as their advisor. What are you going to tell them? The, 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 the wife of the family member is not considered family? She is family. She is, family. She is, she is included in all the documents. The family is going to fund her needs, but it did not extend to her mother. Got it. But her mother's problem is greatly impacting the rest of the family and the family business, which basically supports everyone, comes to you with a problem. Financial, legal, ethical, moral. What, what do you tell them to do? What's the right thing? Advise them to make it anxious because the outside. Um, but they could say, see that this isn't exactly a funding issue, right? So. Um, it's expressed as a funding issue. Expressed as a funding issue. But uh, if I was just saying, um, if, if, if we're, let's, let's hire her some uh, in home care, it would, would sort of be the, I think, the default. Like, okay. go. I'm going to be your devil's advocate. And I am the brother, and I'm saying, hey, wait a minute. I don't want our family resources now to be spent on someone who we all agreed and signed on the bottom line was not going to be included. And that really is part of our dollars that you're speaking about. What do we do when we've locked ourselves into that position? Or should we not have created that kind of structure? How much of this is the funding? So, there, so the earlier discussion said it's been money, money. Up level G1. Right. Now we're at G2. So money's not at G2. Yes. Money's not at G2. You're, you're talking about it. Not enough money's at G2. 
in the planning of the village of Smith, not a caregiver of Smith anyway, it's not a family target of the resource, right? So um, it, it highlights the reality that caregiving is not a legitimate, it's not a fundable, it's like, it's like not being a mom, right? No, it's not real work. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's that's not paid work. Say, it's not, yeah, it's they're not they're legitimate right. work. They're basically saying it's not legitimate. Right. So we shouldn't spend our money. So work. her labor, family member labor, that she's, you know, and the cost that it's creating throughout the business system, I mean, you can put your head in the sand about that, or you know, as, as the liability, or you can fund it. Okay, now she has to go into a dementia unit, and we're looking at $9,000 a month, which, you know, considering that G2 is now paying college expenses, and, you know, again, there's a family structure that the heirs have to work their way into inheritance. There are bars that have to be met for them to increase their share of the pie. They're not there yet. Who's going to assume those expenses? coming into your office, what are you saying? Well, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking about what you're saying. I tend to be more practical and, and address this head on. It's not a matter if you like or dislike the pack that you created before. Here are the circumstances that you said you want to live with. But in light of new information, how are you going to handle it? I'm not going to tell you what is the right way to handle it, but I can help point you at the outcome. If you continue down this path, that family unit, because you're the brother who's not part of that, who's concerned about spending that $120,000 a year at the big kitty, um, is in chaos, will be disrupted, and you have no way of measuring what that loss of attention on the management of the goose is. He's the CFO of the company. If he's the CFO and he's not watching the goose and you could be, you know, cutting off your nose and spite your face because you're not going to spend nine grand, but it just costs you, you know, 50 grand a month in profit out of the business. So you don't have to like this. You can either rethink what, your, what the pact is and address it or you can ignore it and put the goose at peril. Okay. It's not my role to help tell you what to do. You have to make that decision. So then the question becomes, what are the frameworks to help make that decision once you get to that dilemma? So that you're not wringing of hands and then pulling the family apart, which could cause even, even greater problems. I, th I think that was very well expressed and I think that this is something whether it's family trust as Paul has positioned it or families in general that this has a huge place uh, of, of disruption in family life when one member has to go and take care of their loved one and then the remaining party be it a spouse another sibling, what have you, um, has immense conflict in trying to reconcile what was norm and now what has become totally upside down because somebody has reached a point where they're in a role that they never planned for. And regardless of the illness, um, they are still going to have to deal with it irrespective of whether the family agrees or not. In the case that Paul gave, even if as, um, I'm sorry, it's, uh, is it Michael, um, the, the example that you gave, it, it was, was very accurate, I think. I can't tell you what to do, but look at the consequences of, is it pound wise, and you know, is it penny wise and pound foolish? And I, have a, I, have, I have another question that as devil advocate as I'm sitting here, and the question is, people get bifurcated and trifurcated in their roles. So, it's a family business, 
And let's say it was the CFO, but the CFO was for hire and was not a family member. Mm -hmm. What framework or context would you use that? Would you terminate that CFO saying, well, the CFO can't do their job. I need to get a new CFO in. In which case, if that's the action you would take, if the person was a for hire person and not a family member, how would that, how would that decision process integrate with now that it's your brother, should you be firing your brother as CFO or give him leave of absence from that role and put, you know, it, does it make more sense to say, we're putting in another CFO, you go take care of your family and we're going to give you six months, a year to help go support this and we'll give you your salary and we'll do that as a family. I'm just thinking out loud because I can see myself having this conversation and doing just this and raising these issues. Well, you happen to be, I'm sorry, Michael, finish what you were saying. But that's it. No, you, one of the issues you just raised with the paid CFO is something that we see raising its head in the workplace, and that's family relationship discrimination. Um, we do not treat caregivers in the workplace very nicely. And for a long time, um, I'm sorry, the gentleman at the end of the table who was talking about, um, you know, uh, the, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, the both of you were talking about um, pregnancy is an unpaid job, and that a woman who is had a baby and is now quote caregiving obviously can't devote the time and effort but at least under family medical leave and other things we're opening up that category now it's a question of how far does caregiving extend is it only pregnancy and child rearing or is it uh, a key member of your workforce that now has to take care of or be responsible for mom with her dementia or one of your number one executives who needs to be out on the road but the circumstances are he or she needs to be responsible for their sister who has MS and this is this is something that constantly is raising its head in the workplace and is going to be an issue not only of call it morality and what should we do with a with a working caregiver but it's going to be a major point of litigation because the point you just raised Michael about well should we fire him because he's a caregiver um, you know should we fire him because he's a woman who got pregnant you know or she was a woman that got pregnant you can you can begin to understand now where this workplace issue is really um, becoming as big an issue related to caregiving as any other aspect of caregiving and with an older society uh, people are working longer and those are your key you know uh, those are those are the folks that have so much of your uh, you know your mental uh, capability to have the secrets of the of the firm you know they're your your long-standing uh, workers and do you want to put them in that kind of a compromise that you won't recognize the fact that aging begats other responsibilities but you still want to keep them in the workplace David uh, if I may I, I want to get Jane's opinion on this and then let Vicki have the final word and then I we brought a case study that I'd like everyone to take a look at of something that we had to work through and I want we want you take a look at this and to give some input as to how you would handle this if it walked into your office. Jane, on this last situation, as the, as the attorney who drew the documents, what do you say when they come into your office? Well, I wish I would have been able to say what you put forth and have that nice big perspective about it. Um, I think I would have said some of that. If he wasn't a family member, if he was for hire, what would you Doing to draw the distinction. What I like to do is exaggerate situations for people to make them sort of absurd, to try and draw out the prejudice because you see it better. Does that mean any sense? Mm -hmm. um, but in my reality, when it comes down to money, um, 
And as soon as it comes down to money, this family's already lost. If they've already suffered a huge loss right there when the when the, the conflict arrives. And how to repair that is not my area. Um, but I recognize they need to do something about the whole definition of family. Oddly enough, when it happens in the family that I actually deal with, doesn't have the funds because they're waiting for the money to come down to the one. Um, they just knew the money wasn't there. Um, and rather than deal with it, they just fell back on the social safety. So the Medicaid planning. Medicaid planning came in, into play. And that was her loss. You know, the person with uh, Alzheimer's, that was her that was her path because there were no resources for her. Alternatives. Right. And so it it was pretty simple in terms of that path. But uh, in your scenario, while that path may be an option, the damage within the relationship, I, I don't think that I uh, blame it on the instruments that were created, but I think it would, I would certainly point out that we don't, as a group of people at all consider the catastrophic result of the not illnesses, I don't know what you want to call it, but you have Alzheimer's or dementia or, or you have special needs children, which I do a lot of work with special needs kids that are really adults now. Um, if we just kind of like ignore that that exists and just compartmentalize dealt with as a biological family, which is what happens. We just sort of box it in and in your family just to the rest of us. Right. Well, yeah, so, so six brothers and sisters and one head of set of twins and they're both severely developmentally delayed and everybody has a great deal of sympathy for that couple but they're going to struggle forever and nobody's going to lift a finger beyond everybody's going to have their own little... You know, this I is... I don't know what to do about that. I don't, I mean... Yeah. I don't know. It's also... It does because it does to a degree because what we're saying is in the in the hypothetical the woman needed to go into a a, a locked Alzheimer's facility let's call it that where she could get everything she needed and immediately that would reduce what these people are trying to do on their own which is provide her care she has to go into a place that's safe and consistent comfortable and and get her needs address. So instead of spending my days worrying about her, I have a lot more freedom. So that guy potentially is going to come back to work uh, and he'll let that in. I know. So, so this person gone into a Medicaid facility. So there were protests in. But have their needs to tie on. Yeah, their, emotion, their emotional quotient that's part of it may not have changed. But their physical necessity to be present has, has changed. In the case of the CFO, I, how, I, how many of us want to leave our people in an apparently great looking place? It's changed somewhat in the last comment I wanted to make is that I, I would have added to your comments were, and we're not going to consider what to do for the mother in law, what are we willing to do for the caregiver? for respite and support and all the other things that they need because I think the caregiver deserves some consideration and just want them on the, without a, a, they're on a life raft without any paddle. And, and, and from the planning perspective, and I'm going to take you mm -hmm. in a second, this I think is the black hole that Jay was talking about. It's that when the, it's dictated top down that this is the definition of family and this is the way it's going to be, and there is that not, there is uh, no collaboration among those family members who are told sign on the bottom line and get on the train. 
this is where things break down because the real world doesn't break left or break right, and that is an important part of it. And certainly the well-being of the caregiving goes back to what David spoke about earlier, the stresses that it's putting on the family that may or may not have to do with the dollars. Vicki, I want you to have the last word on this because I want to get on to our case yeah. study, which I think you Oh, wow, this is a great example. To your point, the emotional needs of the caregiver um, are not reduced at all because now that I, if I'm really putting mom into a Medicaid facility, that is not one of those nice assisted living facilities usually. That, that's three people in a room. It's, it's very stressful. I'm going, to, if I'm a good loving daughter, I'm going to be checking on them. And when I'm home, speaking as a caregiver, you sleep with the phone by your ear because you are never off call. You are never without those burdens. And then there's the guilt. I've done this to my mom. I mean, the chaos is still brewing. The hands-on effort, yes, that is a lot better than being there all the time. Um, yeah, I, I what support does she need? She needs not just the, yeah. the good daughter. Yes, what she needs is to actually be connected to some support groups. Um, so the good daughter, one of the best things we can do is to connect them to a local depend disease dependent, like the Alzheimer's Association has support groups. The National Alliance on Mental Illness has support groups for their family. Every big disease group has these, and they're they're so helpful because it's a place for them to vent, get support, get ideas. Um, the area agencies on aging have all sorts of resources. So I would start throwing my resources at her. We've got mom settled. Let's let's support her. Um, for somebody who's a spousal caregiver, Wealth Spouse Association is phenomenal. It, it's a great organization, online chat room. People really can still breathe and, and get through it. Um, but Vicki, if your last name was Bacardi or mm -hmm. Gates or Buffett. Well, you don't want to go to that support group. You're not going to that support group. The nice thing about something, there are um, caregiver support groups online that are for any kind, not just wealth spouses, sure. um, where you can have a, an alternate identity. So I would hook them up an with. avatar. Yeah, as, you know, you can have, you can put any name you want, and then at least you could have a safe spot. You know, just like um, physicians who are addicted to uh, substances, they actually have special programs within addictive place of uh, rehab that are just for physicians. And then there are certain places just for the high wealth or the Hollywood because they do have different issues. Absolutely. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention is you were bringing up options. Uh, before I would have laid out, I'm not the financial person, before I would even begin to guess what the financial options are, I think that's when you would have wanted to collaborate and bring in like a geriatric care manager or somebody else that can say, wait a minute, there's three other options that you didn't know about because there's, there's a lot that can now be done. So before we get hysterical that there's only two choices, there's usually more. The best part of what you just said is that there's not a clear line. Uh, pick up the phone if you're, depending on where you are in the spectrum of quali quantitative people, mm -hmm. the attorney or CPA or the financial planner or the CLU or the, or the asset manager or right. whatever role you happen to be in, there's not like a clear book to say, oh, here's my, here's my resource. Guide. And that's right. what we're here for. This is, this is, first question really should be who should be sitting at that table when the call comes to me. I know that's where David and I end up getting a lot of calls in when these kind of situations come in. And David, while I'm giving out these papers, if you have any last comments, I'm going to give you an opportunity to read this, and then we have maybe about a half hour to discuss. That's okay with it. Sure. Uh, well, I think two things. Number one, uh, to say that we can always fall back on Medicaid may not always be the case. The rules are constantly changing, and I think as Vicki pointed out, uh, there's a big difference because if you're in an assisted living facility for dementia, Medicaid will only pay about a thousand dollars towards that nine. You need to be in a skilled nursing facility, and if you're a Medicaid patient, it's not that they can deliberately discriminate, but all of a sudden you have a setting that may not be what you envisioned for your mother not you know and they're entitled to the dignity of who they are and they're not cattle and they just can't be herded into a location because they have it 
and you may not qualify for Medicaid with the five-year look back and a lot of other things. And as far as the good daughter, just because you change the roof from home to a facility doesn't mean you change the responsibility. Now, instead of maybe being a hands-on caregiver, you've got to be an excellent advocate because there are so many things in facilities that slip between the cracks that if you have a, dementia, a loved one with dementia, they can't see it. So you've just got to be even more aware than you were when you kind of had it at home and at least the, the day was encapsulated around things that you could see and respond to. Can I just say two just language things that we're really trying to work on with our aging population? And I'll be glad to send you this. There's an amazing list put out by the Pioneer Network about changing our language. Um, is that when we say an Alzheimer's patient, it's better to say a person with Alzheimer's. So the personhood stays intact and then they have Alzheimer's, always put the disease second. Um, the other language we're trying to change is to call an institution, a facility, a care community, because a lot of them really are quite lovely, and, and they are a community. And to help make that choice easier, it's never easy. Calling it a, an institution versus community sounds a lot different. So. Well said. Yep. So take a glance at this, and... Uh, while we're not necessarily looking for answers, I think what we want to focus on here, what are the questions? I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm just shaking my head. This is a complex case of care. This is normal. This is where I live. <laughs> <laughs> or our world, David. Yeah. Yep. And that's why when we named the program Caregiver Reality, it's because you can't make these things up. This is life as it happens.
So before we have David facilitate the discussion, is there any questions on the fact pattern that has been laid out here? This is what we knew coming in. They come into your office, they said, here's what we need to have done. This was referred to us by, by a financial advisor, and he says, I, I don't even know where to begin. Came to us, imagine us walking into your office. So, point of clarity, um, how would you advise your client? Which, which role? Are you having us in a financial advisor role? Or, uh, or, you, you could be or the attorney, you could be the financial advisor, you could be the bioethicist, you could be within any of the okay. 20 disciplines that we have represented here. Can, can I ask a question, and this is, I'm just trying to frame this so I understand how this works. How, they call you up, but how do you guys get paid? We get paid either per hour for the consultation that we do, or we get paid for a completion of a project where it might be done as a fixed fee. And we have a limited number of very wealthy clients that hire us on an annual retainer basis. In other words, in case of emergency, break glass. And that gets availability to David and I to do whatever needs to be done. OK. So financial, advi quarterback. financial advisor recognizes He's got huge issues. And he has a conflict, an inherent conflict that exists here now. He's got lots of conflicts. And there's huge tax implications and problems. There's ethical issues. Um, clearly, the boat has gone over the waterfall. <laughs> and, uh, and the boat has gone over the waterfall and is Heading, heading down because a lot of what may have been possible is no longer possible. And um, I'm a little overwhelmed as I'm sitting here even trying to think about. Um, but but I, would, I would take the overwhelmed feeling. I mean, that's where I would start because I think the, it's, it's, can you speak louder so David can hear you please? Yeah, so um, it does seem to me that um, there's, there's a very good likelihood that your overwhelmed track, they're overwhelmed. This, this is a major kind of, you know, traumatic insult to a guy like this, this to now have his legs amputated. Um, Son is um, you know, overwhelmed, right? It would be it would be easy to um, so if I had my druthers, um, I don't always have. Um, I might start a meeting like this by simply um, acknowledging the impact of what has just happened. Like before we rush in to start figuring out how to solve it, let's just let's just you know. This has got to turn to the dad. This has got to be really extraordinarily difficult. And and I would do the same thing to the son. And just as kind of housekeeping before we can even start, you know, then sort of starting to ask um, what the son, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking what you guys are saying, you know, or what the son wants to see happen. And, you know, acknowledging that he's also likely to be very, his, his shortness and his need to get on with things, he is likely driven out of fear. And it's like, yeah, why wouldn't you be afraid of that? So I would want to start with that. And, um, you know, sort of quiet the whole thing down. Anytime there was some anger starting to emerge, I, I, I would hear that as both the defense in relationship to the underlying trauma process that's now working. 
way. A lot of pressures on the sun. A lot of pressure. So that, that's why I would, I would sort of identify him as the kind of center of gravity um, of who I would want to be alert to and taken care of, uh, and, and starting to problem solve. Them. Not, not without that. Oh, problem solve. Good word in caregiving. Yep. Um, and do it would, in a good way or good in a good way? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I would take what you're saying absolutely. You've got emotion in the room. You cannot do anything until you calm that down. There's, even if they think they're problem solving, they can't yeah. judge. Um, one thing I would also add to that after acknowledging, validating, I would also normalize. I know this feels overwhelming, but this happens to a lot of families. I've helped families with this so they can feel like you are on their side. You have experience. I know who to call and help you get resources. I know, you know, you validate and normalize. That's where I yeah, would normal, start. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course you're up there. The, and I, I completely agree. The son is going to need tons of nurturing, support, education, all of those things. One thing that happens a lot in these caregiving situations is that we get focused on the adult child and we forget the, the parent. And there's a concept called person-centered care where ultimately we are worried about the person, the patient, that when you said, what does the son want? Well, what does the dad want? It's his health and life, too. So what does the son need, maybe? And then what does the dad want? And then we always have to clean that up because what's possible? Right. There's always those, I just want to be back to normal. Well, that's not possible. But So we just always, one thing we do to advocate for the, the vulnerable senior is to keep them in mind and keep them very present, but nurture the caregiver. Jay, before David starts, any comments? What's um, I don't think it's, uh, from a lawyer's point of view, I don't think it's necessarily helpful. Um, it seems like there's a uh, good lesson here for the son for his own claim. Um, Who has not done anything. Although I wouldn't bring that up. I mean, that would be wrong to do, but I'm just sort of sitting here going, well, yeah, here we go. This is a good platform for more than one thing to address. Um, we have to figure out what legal, I think legal work is best viewed as supporting people to do their own thing. So if, if the legal constructs are in place and things go wrong, you can focus on the person and what's gone wrong and not have a lot further compounding the problem. So Donald Sterling is having a lot further compound the problem because there was no good action strategy, there were things that were not addressed. So I think we can address the exit strategy for the father um, out of the business if that's appropriate in the transition. Not ready to listen to that right now. No, I understand that. I think he has first the normalize and stabilize. I mean, until his physiological and psychological situation is stabilized, because I don't know what's going on and with all the drugs he's taking or whatever. We need someone to take over that the father could probably to have it in his life to help him navigate his doctors and explain what's in English because he doesn't know what that is. I mean, he has nobody explaining anything. He's just going from one place to another. He's got no continuity. He's got no advocate. And David, yep. you have just to break this down as to how this, well, the way that this was a, the way that we approach this problem and, in the la and then we want to spend the last few minutes takeaways and address questions so uh, all right well as Vicki pointed out Jane as you said you know and uh, and the one thing we have to understand this is this is complicated and, it, and the thing that we normally approach when we do something like this is you got to put it in different buckets and then prioritize um, yes the son is one set of circumstances dad is another the legal issues but the son has not been even able to quantify what dad's medical issues are. He's getting pushback from facilities. He had um, a non-reporting neurologist, and since that time, mom has died, and the loss of legs, et cetera. You know, you've got all kinds of grieving, both for himself and for his wife. We don't know whether that's dementia or depression. So before we can put dad in the room, 
we essentially assemble the team to go and evaluate him. A psychiatrist, a physical therapist, um, and that was not because that was our expertise, but as we needed to get a line in the sand of what we could do with dad. At the same time, and we didn't put this into the equation only because you would think we were nuts, but the son was a paraplegic and he was in a wheelchair and um, his ability to get around and do his thinking level was only concentrated for the moment on the business he couldn't even begin to figure out what he was supposed to do with his dad so as Vicky pointed out you know we stepped in as competent authorities and people that could be trusted because the financial advisor that brought us in had the the family's ear and had been so for a while so we said exactly what what you did Vicki we understand we've dealt with this before all these fires cannot be addressed at the same time let's quantify where things are legally financially what can we do is dad competent to still be part of uh, an arrangement to figure out what succession was going to be or even to get documents if dad because he was in pretty precarious financial I mean physical situation if he passed away um, we barely even had a will there we didn't know if we were going to have to deal with him in intestacy in this state um, the son wanted him down in Florida we weren't even sure after they evaluated him what we had suggested and ultimately happened is uh, they were in Vermont we sent him to Tufts Medical and to have him evaluated as to with all smart heads in the room as we say as to whether or not he could travel to Florida how could that happen what would his real long-term physical therapy and rehabilitative needs because the son had gone ahead and started to you know redesign the house for a wheelchair and he just decided to to jump into the middle of things we stopped him and said no once we get a handle on what has to be done we need to have a disability architect take a look at this dad was a big guy and very gruff and they wanted to hire aides through you know a home health care agency and one of the things that we suggested I'm just throwing this out because this is where our our thought processes were moving and ultimately what we did is we found a big guy a seal who was also a paramedic who agreed to sign on because it was somebody that could go up against dad's bluster and the other aide that we were able to find uh, was a former fishing captain who is now a physical therapist and the house ultimately got redesigned as a facility for somebody who had lost his legs we didn't know where we were yet where we were going with the dementia um, ultimately he had dementia but it was being compounded by depression and the psychiatrist helped to pop up that depression to a more workable level and for a period of time we were able he was at a cognitive level that attorneys agreed that he could sign documents and so we then brought in who the financial planner wanted to use in terms of a law firm and they all felt that dad was competent at that point to sign and so at least we were able to get necessary documents in place ultimately Tufts stopped us for a while because they were very concerned that he was in no condition to be transported anywhere but we got him out of what was in Vermont and we put him into a very skilled rehab facility um, and while this is outside the non-clinical we brought in the folks that we knew could do a better job while we were trying to plan what was going to happen going forward as well as to work out that those missing documents inside of a family business that was worth over a, a hundred million dollars so we put it in buckets we prioritized it to figure out what was dad what was son 
where were we really medically what did we need to do to get him to Florida because that was the big lure the son wanted him away from him so he could run the business and that's how we approached it and it's still unfolding um, we're still dealing with a number of issues with dad in Florida uh, the team and uh, the whole boat issue you know um, we had to revamp the dock in order to be able to get not only a wheelchair into it but to sling everything over and you know this was the depth that it had to get down to but having a disability architect um, as part of the team really helped to make a difference because he was very far-sighted and um, was very very helpful in designing the in-house rehabilitation aspect of things and um, so we can pick it up from that point but th this was one of those things where you just had to step in and say we understand we know what we're doing um, and now we need to figure out what the pieces are and then we did we prioritized them and then move forward from there and th ultimately the son was pleased dad's dementia has gotten worse in the meantime but he is at least out on the boat living in florida getting his suntan whether that's good or not these days and um, it helped calm things down and the son you know was able to run the ship so to speak without um without dad there and trying to assert himself into things that he was at, at now at this point not able to do right, david we're coming up on five minutes of we're wrapping up uh some takeaways for our for our folks here today well, yeah, I mean, I think that what we we pointed out is that a non-clinical, you know, process is incomplete unless we've really had a non-clinical plan worked out. And so it took us a little while to put it all together, even though it had clinical components. But I think they were very grateful, and the son I know was, um, to have us because everything was kind of being dictated by a geriatric case manager who only had... A clinical viewpoint. Um, the other thing we recognize is there were other members of the family. The son really wanted to back away from being what we call the alpha caregiver. He couldn't concentrate on both. So by creating a team of really competent people that he could rely on, um, like this paramedic, like the physical therapist, it took a great amount of pressure off there was not a lot of love between them to begin with and that's why it was so difficult because he just didn't want to deal with things he didn't like dad from the beginning and um, there never would have been an opportunity in this particular case one of the takeaways where you couldn't have gotten them to the table um, dad was just too gruff too bluff never thought he was not going to be around when his wife died that really knocked him back on his heels and he had diabetes and then those complications were the things that ultimately resulted in a bilateral amputation um, but I don't think there could have been a planning session in advance and I think that's why we had to pick it up from where it was and it was as sparse as it was because he never thought he was going to die or be incapacitated um, this is a classic example of somebody drowning the sun was drowning and if you look at our logo um, the it, it's really a life ring that's that's kind of what we threw out there both emotionally and practically and along the way the e equals mc squared which with all due respect to you know uh, albert einstein means education means a more competent caregiver and we did educate the sun along the way it didn't change his attitude towards dad, but he had and felt that he had a better grasp on things that started out not a, not even being acknowledged by the nursing home and the and the rehab facility that he had in Vermont. Um, he realized afterwards, and he said to us, and he said to us very recently, you know, I never would have been able to even think the way you guys did and he couldn't he was caught up in such an emotional firestorm that if he didn't have folks that could step in from the outside and assess it 
um, this would have turned into a, a total disaster, uh, both for the company, the family, and and anybody else that was involved with it tangentially. And uh, here, one of last thoughts or questions. Yeah. I, um, the more it's interesting because everyone's different in this room, and the immediate thing we all do is we come from it from our expertise and our point of view. Like I was writing down all sorts of medical questions, like, well, we need to address this, and I need to do this because that's my expertise. And you said this, this is what the law is. This is what the business. I, I'm worried about the taxes, and I think we, that's the purpose of the collaborative is. We need all of each other on the team, you know, and that we we can't be the experts, but we can connect people to the other experts, and that's I think where we really have power and support for our families we work with. So I, I sooner than better. Yeah, because I think the point is that for me is I don't have to be I don't have to be hired to help or to be a sounding board or to give. Uh, thought to help the other person see what the other buckets are. Right. So I'm happy that you called on, I'm honored you called on for an expression of support for the other person and saying, look what I've got on my plate, what the heck should I be thinking about? Yeah. And that's what, that's what you were saying about the collaborative, collaborative right. story too. And I think that what we often do is we try to take on too much within ourselves and then we run up to another hit a blind end or hit a dead end and then we say, oh, now we need to find, oh, now we need this, now we need that. It's like, well, call everybody in the beginning and find out, you know, find out where, where you're at. Right. You everyone, 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 yeah. Reach out. You have to build it now. Right. Yeah, reach out and you know, talk about it. And, not just and have everyone out. build their question and action yeah. list, you know, at the same time right. instead of even remaking the wheel over and over again. Yeah. And that person that initially called may not be the person that you end up having on the team, but at least you've got something. I think we're all here to help each other that way. Absolutely. I know people can call me. I mean, yeah. yeah. You, and now it goes back to what I said. Tufts was the equivalent of Mayo. You know, all smart heads in the room, but each one a specialist in their own right. Hearing the story without somebody else's interpretation and thinking it through from their perspective and then coming together afterwards and saying, what did we all hear? And that we have found that getting that kind of collaborative excellence to kind of hypothecate a little bit of PPI's um, vision, um, intuitive, yes, and collaborative excellence. And, and that really makes up a team that does the client a world of good, makes everybody feel good about what they're doing, and ultimately results in an outcome peace of mind, quality of life for the client, um, and that's really what this is all about. I don't know if I can exactly call it happiness, but at least they know they've had a great David, team working. David, the room is being called upon for the next meeting, so we are going to need to wrap up and... Uh, well, I'd like to say thank you from, from sunny and overly hot Florida, and it's been a pleasure doing this with you. Thank you both for and being here. You would like Thank a you. copy of our notes that we did in preparing this? Uh, yes, that would be I'm wonderful. Sure, I have your cards. That would be fabulous. Send yeah. them out to you. And uh, as you expressed, Jane, you are more than happy to be there just as a sounding board for expertise. And I've called upon yeah. Vicky already. Uh, we are all of that mind that we right. we're in this together. And co if together we can do a better job for our clients then we've served a higher good. Right. I, that's why I keep coming here. It's yeah. like, they'll need me occasionally. <laughs> you don't need me most of the time, but right. you need to know someone like me and someone like Paul and David exist. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, that's, that's been one of John A.'s missions, and we still didn't get many people in the room. Not this time. But that's all right. New people well, came, and, you know, it spreads. You know? Um... Well, sometimes it's also hard. There's a lot of good stuff going yeah, on. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of good stuff going on. Yeah. But also, it's, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you just need to have to practice yeah. some hard. Yeah. Are, are you, being a former past president of FPA and other number of other organizations, are you giving 
this in a 35, 40 minute talk to the uh, Society of Financial Service Professionals, to the Financial Planning Association, to the CPA subgroups that meet on a regular monthly basis, to the Estate Planning Council, because to me this yeah. is a presentation that has to come together that you go out and, and do. 